Hi, everyone. We're waiting on Real Doctor Six to join us. I'm so glad you guys are making this. I'm really, really excited for this interview. Hey, how are you? Hi, how are you? I'm doing good. I'll just adjust this a little bit. Thank you so much for sitting down with me today. I'm so excited for this. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's awesome. Thank you. So I've been following you for a long time. I really, really love your posts. So I was so honored when you accepted this request. Well, thank you. And I love watching your stories and your posts. So that's awesome too. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to go ahead. Um, the questions that I have are some questions that I get all the time, but I also asked everyone. So this will go everything from the basics to some more in-depth questions, including some of the safety issues. Okay. So I just want you to first just talk about um, the process of liposuction fat transfer BBLs. And if you'll also touch on skinny BBLs. Uh, that's a huge topic. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a wide spectrum. Where would you like me to start? Um, just talk about what it is exactly. Um, talking about the lipo fat transfer specifically. Mm -hmm. So I guess for the people that don't know, a Brazilian butt lift is a term that refers to a two-stage process. Where first you perform liposuction. So you liposuction a particular area to harvest fat. You then mm -hmm. process the fat and inject it into a different area. In, a, in the case of a Brazilian butt lift, it's into the butt. Um, it's not as easy as it sounds uh, because um, unlike a typical liposuction, when you harvest the fat, you want to be very gentle so that when you get the fat out, you don't traumatize the cells, they survive. And when you injure them into the butt, you want to do it in such a way, again, that the fat cells survive. Now, what people need to understand, it's not as simple as taking fat from here and putting it in there. When you take fat cells from their natural environment, you are removing them from the, from the blood supply. And now you have this you know, a bottle of fat that you're gonna inject. You can't inject it like, like, like an implant. Implant is this one round thing that you put mm -hmm. in. When you inject fat cells, you have to almost like spray paint. You, you spread out the fat cells because each fat cell is now devascularized, doesn't have oxygen, it's gasping for air, it's dying. And you wanna be able to get oxygen to diffuse from the healthy surrounding tissues to these cells while the body is healing. And you have to make sure the body is able to heal quickly, new blood vessels grow into this injected area so that these new fat grafted cells are able to survive, get oxygen and nutrients. So it's, 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 it's a little bit tricky. So there's, there's a science of it. There's the art of it in sculpting the bodies. And uh, this is where experience comes in because anybody can understand the principles of fat grafting, but really um, getting the shape just right, it, that, it's just a matter of experience. You can't read about it, you can't watch videos, you just keep doing it, doing it and do a lot of that. And finally, the big topic is safety. Um, a couple of years ago, BBLs um, got the rap of being probably the deadliest cosmetic surgery procedure because there was a paper uh, initially out of, uh, it's a combined paper, Mexican and Brazilian surgeons, and then US surgeons looked at the same thing and found that a mortality rate in BBLs was very, very high. So that raised a lot of alarm bells. Yeah. Since then, we've looked into this, and I don't know if I'm gonna talk about it later, but that's a whole big topic. Uh, but I just wanna reassure your followers, it is, it is not as scary as it sounds assuming you go to somebody who understands the anatomy, understands the techniques and does this properly. Because like anything, if you do it safely, you're gonna be safe. If you don't do it safely, if you don't know what you're doing, you, you're deadly, you, people die. And, and, and that's why there's, you know, there, there's accounts on social media, you know, there's one doll memorial or something like it. It's, it's really sad that there's, that there's an account like that, that people go and have these surgeries and keep dying and people keep going and and this just keeps happening. So safety is a big thing. And as a result, a lot of us got together and uh, Dr. Miami sort of spearheaded this uh, effort. We've created what's called VAX, World Association of Gluteal Surgeons. So a bunch of people that specialize in BBLs got together from around the world to create this association to help promote safe BBLs. Okay, and I do wanna talk a little bit more about the safety um, in a little bit, but I'm so glad that you touched on it because it's so very important. And a lot of people don't realize when they are going to places and they might go to discount places, try to save money and they don't realize that they're risking their lives. Um, but let's start with more of the basics. Um, when someone comes to you for a consultation, what does that go? Like, what is your ideal candidate? And please specify ages because I get that, that um, question all the time. Age is not an issue as long as you're healthy in general. When it comes to BBLs, I personally have a cutoff. I think other surgeons have a cutoff as well, some don't. My cutoff is 50 years. And the reason is that it's been shown that, you know, as you get older, your body heals slower. So the speed at which the new blood vessel is able to grow 
and revascularize the fat grafts is slower, so lower proportion of fat grafts survive. Now, yes, it is possible to do a BBL in someone over 50. Um, I simply choose not to, as it's just one of the cutoffs that I have. And is your lowest number 18 or 21, or how, what is your? Uh, I rarely go below 21, 22, because when your BMI is that low, you have very low fat. Now, there are people out there that are lucky, that are super skinny, super lean, and just have to, happen to have fat in just the right spot. And the just the right spot tends to be love handles. If you have, if you're super skinny, just big love handles, my ideal patient. If you can sculpt those beautifully, put into the butt, uh, looks amazing. And that's called a skinny BBL, right? So skinny BBL is a BBL. It's a regular BBL, but it's done on somebody who's got very little fat. So they need to understand the goal of a skinny BBL is more about body sculpting than butt augmentation. So really creating curves a little bit from here, a little bit there, creates a nice curve, but you're not getting a huge butt because you just don't have enough fat. And mm -hmm. one more thing I forgot to mention when talking about BBLs and fat grafting in general, this is something people need to understand. When you transfer fat, not all of it survives. On average, 50%. I have patients that have like 80%. I have no idea how I did that. I have patients that have less than 50%. But typically I tell my patients, 50% of what we're gonna put into your bump is not gonna survive and over three months gets excreted. So if you look at you know, Instagram, the Snapchat stories, your typical surgeon is injecting between 800 and 1,000 cc's. So really it means you're getting 400 to 500 cc's of butt augmentation. Okay, and would that be about one pound of fat or so if they're getting 500 cc's, 400 cc's? So 500, 500 cc's is about, is about a pound of fat, yes. Okay, perfect. And um, you did say only 50% of the, trans fat, the transferred fat stays on average. Yeah. Um, but how permanent is the entire procedure? So say 50% of it lives, is that forever? Or is it like maybe it, 10 years or? Nothing is permanent. Okay. De death and taxes are permanent. Nothing else is permanent. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it, it is permanent in a way that what you're doing is you're transferring fat cells. So fat cells go into your butt and the 50% that survive stay there forever. But as you age, and gain weight, these fat cells can swell up. If you lose weight, they shrink. Mm -hmm. As you age, the fat distribution changes. So more fat is being deposited maybe into your thighs or into your breasts, more into the butt. So things change, but the actual fat cells themselves, once they survive, they survive permanently. Okay, so then let's talk about the maintenance of a BBL. So you did say like, if you gain weight, you know, then like say it's transferred to your butt, your butt gets bigger, um, which is what I think it happens with the Kardashians. Um, but what is, like, how do you, tell your patients to maintain and what other life events like pregnancy, how does that affect that? And including the areas that you suck the, the fat from. So once you've had your BBL, you want to maintain it. Uh, and from my point, from medical point of view, I simply tell people maintain your weight, you know, live a healthy lifestyle. I know there's all these BBL dolls out there that have all these regimens that they do, low fat, high fat, get fat, no fat. Um, I'm not sure there's much scientific evidence behind it. Do whatever works for you. But in terms of maintenance is maintain a healthy lifestyle. Understand that if you lose weight, you're gonna lose weight, but you're gonna lose it everywhere. If you gain weight, again, you'll gain weight everywhere. Now, when you do gain weight, things can happen, weird things can happen because the fat that we've transferred to your butt, if you're lucky, this is the stubborn fat. So we took it from a stubborn area. This is the fat that, ten, these are the fat cells that tend to absorb fat first and release it second. So that means that if you gain weight, it's going to your butt, awesome. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that's not the case. Maybe this is just regular fat. This is not the preferential deposit where your body wants to put fat and then your body puts fat elsewhere. Now, now let's say with liposuction, your tummy, your left handles, there's no fat cells there or fewer mm -hmm. fat cells. There's less ability to absorb fat. So your, your belly, your left handles don't get so big, but maybe your, your brow rolls, your arms grow, maybe your chin grows, and you get maybe a bit of a different fat distribution. Okay, yes. And just for everyone to know, after puberty, your body doesn't produce any more fat cells. Your fat cells can get really, really big, but you don't produce anymore. Correct. So that makes a lot of sense. And in some cases, that can even lead to you looking um, really disproportionate, even if the surgery was proportional. But if you don't maintain, you can just look really off, right? You know, it's, it's not that uncommon that sometimes I, I see people come back to me, you know, years after BBL, and they look unhappy. But yeah, it, it's not that the surgery went wrong. It's your body has changed. It aged, gravity has its uh, effect, and you've gained weight. And the fat went into areas that are out of my control. Like I can't control where your body's going to deposit the fat cells or, or fat into fat cells. Okay, that's what I figured. Um, I do want to talk about the danger a little bit more. So 
Um, you did say that, I mean, it is risky if you're not going to the right person because you do have to have a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge to be able yeah. to prevent it. Um, but what do you, what, let's start with what increases risk. And I know you did say maybe age can increase risk or is that just the risk of it not no. working? Okay. No, that's a good question. Let me increase the answer. No, I have no, that's no, nobody's ever died in my clinic. However, please understand that that is always a risk. Whenever you have any surgical procedure, there's always risk of complications. Things can go wrong. The worst thing that ever happened is that. Luckily, never happened to me. And I hope it never does, but I can never give anybody a guarantee it doesn't happen. And I, I really hope it doesn't. But the fact is that it's always a risk and it's always a little bit stressful. Going back to BBLs, um, age doesn't matter. Medical conditions don't matter. Well, they do, but specifically for this thing, the thing that's dangerous about BBLs is what's called fat embolism. Mm -hmm. Fat embolism is a condition when fat gets into the blood vessels, it flows into the lungs and causes an embolism, which means obstruction of blood flow to the lungs. So what happens is you're not able to perfuse your lungs and it's like you're suffocating from the inside. And uh, Dr. Del Vecchio is one of, one of the surgeons that's you know, well known for doing research into this. There's a group of uh, plastic surgeons in Miami that have done autopsy on people that unfortunately passed away. And they found one common thing in all of them. They had fat in their gluteal veins. Gluteal vein is a vein that's deep to the gluteal muscles in the butt. And somehow these vessels got damaged and fat was injected or sucked into them. And this clogged up their arteries, and this is why these people died. And so from this research, we now have what's called safe BBL. That's a term that um, a bunch of surgeons came up with, Dr. Dr. Mami, Dr. Delvecchio. And what it refers to is principles. When you're doing your BBL, you do not inject into the muscle or under the muscle so that you don't get any fat going close to the vessels. You don't inject into the vessels or try not to damage those vessels. You want to be using a cannula that's big and rigid. So when you inject, it doesn't get deformed and goes into a different place. And you wanna be always aiming for what I call the danger zone. And if anybody of you guys, if you're watching my uh, Snapchats, every time I do a BBL, almost every time I talk about the danger of BBL and, and always show how we take steps to avoid it. And knowing what we know now, I personally feel very safe about a fat embolism. Like, again, I can't give anybody 100% guarantee it doesn't happen, but I feel pretty comfortable. I know there, there are surgeons out there that have stopped doing BBLs because they were afraid. It's a, it's a serious risk. But knowing the anatomy and knowing the technique and knowing what we do, I feel comfortable knowing that I am nowhere near those vessels. And so the risk of this is extremely small, never zero, but extremely, extremely small. Uh, the thing that I worry about when it comes to BBLs is infection because the fat that you inject into the butt is a perfect medium for bacteria. So I'm really paranoid about this. I have my patients stay in touch with me for two weeks after surgery. I want them to be messaging us every single day. Let us know if they have fever, chills, night sweats, if they have temperatures. And the first sign of anything, I put them on IV antibiotics because if you allow bacteria to go wild in this bowl of fat that's avascular, there's no immune system, there's no antibiotics, there's no white blood cells, it's a recipe for disaster. Okay. That makes sense because there's not really a way to sterilize the fat before putting it back in yeah. or using aseptic techniques either, I guess. Um, so you did kind of answer my next question, which is why do you perform it? Cause it's like one of the riskiest. So I will change that question a little bit. Do you think, um, in later studies are going to find that it's less risky than they first thought? Cause right now they're saying it's one in 3000. Correct. So that's, that's a study that came out and, uh, Dr. Delvecchio has been kind of spearheading the, the fight against it to, to prove that, that that study is flawed. Uh, WAGS members, we have, I, I think we've, we've pulled all our data. I don't quote me because I don't remember exactly, but there was like maybe 80,000 BBL procedures. Um, and the number of deaths was extremely small. It was not in one in 3,000, it was, it was much lower. Um, Dr. Miami, Dr. Delvecchio and uh, uh, Dr. Worldwide are uh, going to be publishing the data on this just to show that a BBL, if done properly, is actually less risky than a Tamitak. Tamitak actually has higher mortality rate than a BBL when done properly. Why is that? Why is it better than Tamitak? No, why is a Tamitak more dangerous? Um, I personally don't really like tummy tucks. I think there are a lot of other better procedures, but that's just me. I but... love tummy tucks. I love. <laughs> I know. I've seen them, and you do them pretty well. I just thank you. They they weird me out usually. So it's 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 the one that my people my my followers tell me is the one that that's the worst to look at. 
but it's beautiful anatomy. You can see things and you, you make such a dramatic transformation, especially for massive weight loss patients where they have these aprons of extra skin and you can make them look beautiful. I, I love it. But why is it more dangerous than a BBL? Frankly, I don't know. Um, I'm going to make a guess. It is related to what's called deep venous thrombosis. So um, when, when people have surgeries and, and a lot of surgeons take a long time doing tummy tuck. So I take maybe one and a half to two hours to do a tummy tuck. Someone could take six hours. The longer surgery goes, the higher the risk of complications. And specifically, we're looking for uh, infections and deep venous thrombosis. So it's similar like to fat embolism, but instead of fat, blood can clot. So DVT is one of the reasons why someone may die after cosmetic surgery, because cosmetic mm -hmm. patients are usually pretty healthy. But if they're on a, on a table for a very, very long time, the risk of deep venous clots just goes up. And I saw someone that was asking about why, you know, like in Dominican Republic or some other people, uh, places, people do so much more surgery, or is it not possible in Canada? Uh, in Canada, in the States, doctors are more, much more conservative because we know that if we pile on too many procedures and if the procedure takes way too long, your risk of all these other complications goes up. So in my practice, I try to limit the procedure to about four, five hours. And that could be 10 little ones or two big ones. So it's not about number of procedures, it's about the time under the anesthesia. And if I do prolonged procedures, we take extra precautions to minimize risk of deep venous thrombosis. Okay, awesome. Um, do you ever use blended methods such as using the BBL fat transfer and also doing filler or is that you keep them totally separate, maybe do them on very different days? Uh, one, I don't do fillers for the butt. Two, I think it's a bad idea because once again, you're introducing more complication to BBLs. So now you're injecting a filler, a foreign substance into a fat graft your potential risk of infection just, again, went up again. And like I said, my, my biggest concern, aside from the fat embolism, is infection. I'm really paranoid about it. I would not want to be introducing anything like this. Um, that's one thing. Second thing, fillers for the butt. So there's the legal fillers and there's the illegal butt shots. Legal fillers are medically available uh, substances that are usually non-permanent. So in Europe, they used to have a uh, hyaluronic acid based filler that will last about a year. In North America, we have something called sculpture that lasts about two okay. to three years. I've tried sculpture. I was excited to you know, use it on skinny, skinny patients. And I've stopped using it because one, I found it's too expensive. I just couldn't bear myself to charge people $40,000 for a result you can barely see. And two, what sculpture does, it introduces, it, it uses the body to grow collagen. Collagen mm -hmm. is, the fun, is the stuff that makes up scars. So we, we're putting scar tissue into the body. And that's what it felt like when I put injections in. It felt hard. It felt like, it felt like scar tissue. And I, I just didn't like it. And then as time went on, I perfected my skinny BBL. And now I can do a skinny BBL on a patient. That otherwise, I would have been trying to do sculpture on. And a skinny BBL is cheaper, way better, way nicer. And more permanent. More permanent. And let me, let me go on a little tangent on illegal butt shots because I ran <laughs> Go about ahead. It. Please do. I'm with ladies, you. Honestly. Ladies out there, please don't do them. They're cheap, they're easy, you can do it in your home, you can have limitless, limitless volume. It's all amazing, but it's a ticking time bomb because once it becomes infected, it does not come out. You can't suck it out. You have to cut it out. And just Google the disasters of, of, uh, of butt shots. You see all these deformed cut up butts because they're just horrible. So please don't do it. Uh, I know everybody knows somebody who had it done and it's looking great and all that stuff. It's not worth it. It, it is just not worth it. Don't do it. Don't do it. I 100% agree. Always make sure you're going to a qualified injector if you're getting injections. A plastic surgeon that's qualified. You've seen their work. I mean, do your research. Vet them out. This and, is and really, really important. These, 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 uh, these butt shots are done by people that you can never reach. It's done in some shady hotel room that once they disappear, you can never find them again. Uh, not good. And you get what you pay for. I mean, if every other doctor is charging ten to thirty thousand dollars, and this one person is charging four thousand, yeah, ask yourself why. Yeah. Going on with that, what tips do you have for choosing a doctor? And do you have any questions that you think a candidate absolutely should ask? Um, choosing your plastic surgeon, cosmetic surgeon is extra great. For a BBL. For a BBL, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, for BBL, it all comes down to experience. You want to go to somebody who does a lot and has a lot of before and afters they can show you, not just then, but a lot. Um, different views, different angles, has a lot of happy uh, patients. 
and it's safe. I think safety is a big thing because it's, it's, it's not that difficult to take you know, liposuction, a little bit of fat, jam it to somebody's butt and be done. Um, I, I see a lot of people, you know, posting pictures uh, with their BBLs, like right on, top, on, on the table. On the table, remember, it's before the 50% dies. And, and if it's not done properly, 100% can die. So you really don't know where it's going to go up. And sometimes I have these people saying, oh, I went to this doctor and, and uh, he did this great job, but it all died. Well, it, it didn't die by itself. There was, there was something that wasn't done properly. Second thing is, safety. Uh, you want to look at a surgeon who's safe and you want to look at a facility that's safe, uh, where, they, where they work. You want, to, you want to go to a place that's reputable. You often hear these stories, you know, mind-boggling stories. You know, uh, someone say, I was sitting in a clinic and it was like dirty and I saw people with bloody stuff walking around and, and clearly non-hygienic. And these people are sitting there and think like, why are you going for surgery in a place like this? Um, facility matters. The doctor matters. Um, it's, it, it's, it's a tough one. I, if I had a solution, if I had a, a formula on how to choose a surgeon, I'd, I'd publish it and make millions of dollars. <laughs> well, I always tell people, if you feel uncomfortable in any way, if you feel like you're being pushed to do something you don't want to do, if the doctor's not Absolutely. listening to what you want, there's a difference between them explaining, this is what's going to fit your body better. But if they're pushing you to do bigger or do more, and you're just really uncomfortable and you get a, a weird feeling, listen to that feeling. Yeah. And uh, I just met someone mentioned that. Yes, very important, aftercare. So I, I had a patient of mine who had a BBL and she wanted to get around to, and I just said, yeah, you don't need it. Yeah. So I turned her away. So of course she went and found somebody else. Um, and she then called my clinic because they did a surgery and totally forgot about her. She couldn't talk to anybody. She couldn't reach anybody. She was in a different country talking to my nurse, came on the phone at night to try to walk her through what to do and how to do it. She was left totally abandoned in excruciating pain in a country where she didn't speak the language. So aftercare is important. Um, I, I say this a lot of my stories, surgery is not the end of it. When you leave the OR, the process has not finished. The recovery phase is very important. During the recovery phase, you do your best to protect what I've done and you can very easily destroy what I've done. There's no surgery that's foolproof. There's, there's nothing I can do that you cannot destroy if you don't follow the post-op instructions or if we don't take good care of you. So I look after my patients for a long time after surgery to make sure that they heal well. Okay, so will you tell us like the most important after like post-procedure rules that you have? For BBLs? Mm -hmm. uh, initially, stay in touch with us. Please don't disappear. I wanna know how you're doing. I want you to email us and text us daily just to make sure everything's healing well. You don't wanna be sitting on your butt. So I tell my patients, don't sit on your butt for at least two weeks. But I find those of them that are OCD and don't sit on your butt for two months to three months do maintain more fat. So the longer you don't sit on your butt, the more of the fat you will survive. And finally, massage, massage, massage is your best friend. People always talk about fibrosis after surgery, after liposuction. Fibrosis is normal. Fibrosis is the body's response to the injury, which is a surgical injury, which is the liposuction. When you liposuction area, it's a surgical injury. Your body creates scar tissue. Scar mm -hmm. tissue tends to clump together and you get these clumps and bumps. So even though you may look perfectly smooth and nice on the table, if you don't massage your lipo areas, I guarantee you, you, you will clump up and lumps and bumps. So massage is very, very important. And that's why I've introduced massage to my clinic. And so now we have RMTs that provide services to our liposuction patients. Oh, that's awesome. And you do that for the liposuction and the butt area too, like where the fat was injected uh, or just do, where you were do not, do not massage your butt. Let okay, so big. just where you- Just the liposuction, yes. Okay, perfect. Um, and then before we maybe take, because we still have some time to take some questions, um, do you have any other comments, recommendations, suggestions, or anything you just want to point out to us? I will say people like to ask about costs. You can give us a range or, and I know it's dependent on the person and what all they're doing. But. Yeah. So for our fees, we, we are very upfront. All our fees are on our website. So you guys can go to our profile. There's a link in our bio to our fees page. Take a look at it. Um, these fees include everything except for tax and uh, prescription. You know, if you have to go and get a prescription for medications, that's additional, but everything else is included. The fee is very variable. Um, you can, get, you can get a B-bill for very low and humongous fees. And it, it depends on many factors. Uh, the reputation of the surgeon, the service that you get, the pre and post-op care, um, the quality of the surgeon, um, and um, 
some, you know, some people are super expensive for no good reason and some people are super cheap and you, 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 you want to run away from that. You know, if you look for cheap plastic surgery, you will get cheap plastic surgery. That, that's a quote I read a long time ago and I always remember it. I agree. You get what you pay for. All right, yeah. let's see if we have some questions. Um, let's see, some of these we've already answered. Does Canada have a limit to how much you can inject in? Okay. There, there's no law. I know, I think in Florida, they have a specific leaders in Minnesota. One of my colleagues tells me there's a specific number of leaders they can liposuction. We don't have it. It's, it's up to the judgment of the doctor. Um, typically, you know, you, you you want to stay below four to five to six liters per patient. Now, a big patient can handle more. A tiny patient, you know, on a tiny patient, six liters is humongous. On a, on a bigger patient, six liters is minimum. So it, it, it depends a little bit on a patient. The thing though is if you do too much liposuction, you create hemodynamic disturbances uh, and that can lead to cardiac problems, can lead to respiratory problems, uh, can cause infections, can cause DVTs and embolisms. So it, it's a safety issue. So uh, there was, there was a, as I noticed while we were talking, there was somebody asking, is it why doctors in Canada don't do as much as people in the DR and elsewhere? Um, yeah, we, we'd rather be safe. Safety first, uh, cosmetic second, you know. It doesn't matter how good you look when you're on your death table. Um, and will you talk a little bit about lipo burns? I'm getting a lot of questions and comments. So lipo burn is not really a burn. It's, it's a term that refers to skin necrosis, which can result from two Two, two reasons. One, it actual burn, uh, which can happen if you use laser. So laser or sometimes ultrasound can actually create heat that creates burn okay. or it comes from friction. So if you use regular liposuction or power liposuction, if you scrape the underside of the skin too long, if, if you're too close to the skin edge and you scrape it up, you damage the fine blood vessels underneath, the blood vessels die, the skin has no blood supply. What does it look like? Uh, initially, it looks like a really, really bad bruise, it doesn't go away. Then it turns into a black skin and then it becomes into a, into a nasty scar. Oh, wow. And is there any way to fix that um, or reverse if, it? If you, if you think you have a lipo burn, it's, it's almost like an emergency for a skin. You want to get oxygen to that area as soon as possible. So if I ever see something like that, we put topical paste that open up circulation. I would refer the patient to, uh, to hyperbaric oxygen. Hyperbaric oxygen is your best friend. Uh, whenever you want to boost your healing. Think of hyperbaric oxygen like doping for your immune system. It just really energizes you and, 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 can, and can minimize uh, potential lipo burns and lipo burn scars. I didn't, never heard of lipo burns. So that was really interesting. We talk a little bit about um, the sculpting that you do with lipo. So this is where it's, it's really the art of, uh, of liposuction plastic surgery. Um, it, this is something that just comes from experience. Liposuction is a, is a field procedure. You don't really see what you're doing, you're feeling, because your cannula is underneath the skin. You don't really see why you have liposuction. It's the other hand that really feels and is sensing, like almost like a sonar. You can kind of feel where your tip is, and you're sculpting the body, trying to take the fat from the just right place, just right amount, to be able to create nice curves. So it's, it's all about curves. Just think, think of it as sculpting jello. Okay, so <laughs> I'm like, like a sculptor that's, that's sculpting a marble statue, which is actually easy because, you know, you, you can shave it off, you can, sh you can chisel it off. Fat is like blubber, right? And if you're trying to, try to sculpt it, it's actually very difficult. So we often have, a forum, uh, we have visitors coming to observe and learn how we do things. And I tell them just to understand what I'm doing, go home, get yourself a bowl of jello, take a straw and use a straw to, to, to suck out the shape and see how well that goes. <laughs> and it sounds really, really difficult. It's not easy. <laughs> but to me, it makes all the difference when you have those abnormally flat bellies that just don't have any dimension and that just isn't realistic. So. Yeah. Yeah. So Dr. Horos is the guy that's uh, best known for this, uh, the high def lipo. He's the one sort of coined the term. Um, phenomenal things that you can do with sculpting. Do you put people under general anesthesia for lipo BDLs? Uh, I do. Uh, I know there are clinics out there that do a local. Uh, when you do local, there's only so much that you can freeze. So the freezing agent is, is a drug and there's such a thing as a toxic bill. So you can't give someone too much. Uh, and for that reason, I find that people that do LiPo360 BBLs on the local kind of, their hands are tied. They can't be as aggressive. They can't do as much. So you get less of a result. Uh, I understand some people are scared of going under it. You know, people are terrified of GA, general anesthesia. Um, think of it as the best sleep you've ever had. You go to sleep. 
you wake up, it feels like it's only been five seconds throughout this whole time. There's an anesthesiologist that's watching you and assuming you have one because there are some shady clinics that have no anesthesiologist or, or the guy just goes on a break while you're having surgery. So you go to a place that, that's reputable and you're being monitored and the patients say, you know, it's the best sleep I've had. They wake up and they, they slept through the whole thing better than being awake in my opinion. If I was to have a BPL, which I don't think I need one, but not that I have a big butt, but <laughs> I, I would not want to go through this awake. All right, well, I have two last questions, and then um, a lot. Someone keeps asking about your wait list, so we'll get to that one. Um, I know that you want people to continue exercising so they can maintain their weight, but someone said if they were heavy lifting and you know trying to build their butt, will that actually um, make their BBL smaller? No. Uh, live a healthy lifestyle, exercise, do whatever you want. Uh, I don't recommend. I don't recommend people gaining weight for BBL, or I don't discourage exercising for BBL. Well, let's talk about your wait list. Apparently, you have a very long wait list. We do. Uh, so our wait list depends on the procedure. So bigger procedures, we're booking several months out. Small things like you know, one-hour procedure, we can squeeze you in at the end of the day earlier, easier. But for BBLs, uh, we're booking out. I think about six, seven months or so. Um, oh. I, I try to limit to two BBLs per day. Uh, it's quite a workout. So, <laughs> um, you know, two a day just piles up and, and we are booked out so far. Okay, so and for those of you guys that want a BBL, please plan ahead. Don't go and say, can I get a BBL tomorrow? Um, it doesn't work like that. So you should plan about a year ahead. Plan ahead, yes. Get okay. ready. I did find the last question. Um, it's talking about supercharged BBLs, which is, of course, you know, the BBL with the implant. Do you recommend yeah. those? Do you do those? I don't. I, I'm not a big fan of those. Again, you, what you're doing is you're complicating the whole process because you put an implant and fat grafts. Potentially, there's a risk of infections. Now, this is a procedure that's ideal for someone who's really, really skinny. And really what you're doing here is you, you're doing a butt augmentation with an implant. That's your primary mode of butt augmentation. And then you put a little bit of fat on top to try to hide the outlines of the, of the, of the implant. Um, uh, there, there are people that do that and, and great. Uh, I personally don't like to do that. Uh, I try to just do a simple skinny BBL. So I, I, I don't do butt implants anymore. I used to, I, I like doing the surgery, but I sort of faded away from it. I just, I just can't do it all. I, I mean, everyone gets their specialty. So that's why you should choose the surgeon that does the procedures that you like and does the most of them. Yes. Um, I do have one last question that I thought of, and then someone else kind of said something about it, scarring. Um, what are some, are there visible scars and um, how big are they with BBLs? So a BBL is done where you, you, know, you inject what's called a cannula, the instrument. And the, mm -hmm. the instrument can be from two, three, four to five millimeters big. So think of it as a little incision about that big. They are strategically placed to hide them. Typically they hide really well. So once they're fully healed, it's this little pale line that you barely see. Uh, if you guys watch my stories, I hide them in the groin. So those you don't see. Two on a side, that are like kind of visible, but they're just in line. So if you wear a bikini, it's covered up. And then one in the butt crease or under the butt crease, again, well hidden. So once they heal, they should be invisible. Now, not everybody heals well. So understand some people have abnormal scars. You can have a hypertrophic scar. You can have a keloid scar. Or the scar itself may be perfect, but the skin around can get discolored. So you don't really see the scar. You just see a, a patch of discoloration so that we can make a scar more visible. Awesome. Thank you so much for answering all of my questions. It was really informative and I'm so glad that we did this today. Thank you, Andrew. Was, thanks for right. having me. And everyone, please follow him. I've followed him for so many years and I love his posts. He's hilarious. His whole team is hilarious. He's very talented and he has some of the most natural work I've seen, so. Thank you. All right, everyone have a wonderful weekend. Have a good night, bye.